Good afternoon and welcome to the Voices in Leadership webcast, a series focusing on the nexus of science and leadership to create positive change in public health. I'm Betty Johnson and I have the privilege to direct this program and introduce today's guest. Senator Trent Lott represented the people of Mississippi in Congress for 35 years and is one of a handful of officials who have held elected leadership positions in both the House of Representatives and Senate. During his 16 years in the House and 19 years in the Senate, he worked with several presidential administrations and was a savvy coalition builder and deal maker. He was a Senate Majority Leader, Senate Republican Whip, and House Republican Whip. In 2006, Senator Lott was elected Senate Republican Whip, giving him the distinction of being the only person to hold that position in both the House and Senate. Today, Senator Lott co-chairs the public policy practice and provides strategic advice at Squire Patton Boggs, consulting and lobbying clients on a wide range of public policy issues. Senator Lott and fellow former Senator John Bro founded the Bro Lott Leadership Group, a bipartisan public policy firm. But to have some fun while he was in the Senate, and to loosen the group up a bit, Senator Lott established the Singing Senators who made a CD called Let Freedom Sing. He was the first senator, as best as we can determine in the history of the Senate, to wear a Scottish kilt from his ancestry on the floor of the Senate for a day he established on April the 6th, 1998, called the Tartan Day in America. In our audience today is also Mrs. Trisha Lott and their son, Chet Lott. We welcome you. Before I turn this session over to today's interviewer, Dr. Robert Blinden, Senior Associate Dean for Policy Translation and Leadership Development here at the school, please join me as we welcome Senator Trent Lott to the Voices in Leadership series at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Uh, Betty, thank you very much. This is actually part two of a series. Uh, the first was with Senator Tom Daschle, and we're trying something new. Senator Daschle, in a minute, is going to introduce Senator Lott from his last uh, appearance here. Let's see if we can make this work. So does that change what the majority leader does in the Senate? Or? It does. Yeah. It does change. I, the majority leader today is expected to be a partisan warrior. Um, you know, Senator Lott, uh, one of, I, I had the good fortune to work with three Republican leaders, Bob Dole, Trent Lott, and, and uh, Bill Frist. And uh, Trent and I served, of the 10 years that I served as leader, uh, I served with Trent for six years. And we just, uh, for the last couple of years, we've been writing a book. We call it Crisis Point. It came out about six <coughs> weeks ago, available on Amazon. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, uh, before we start this, let me just take a minute explaining why Health School is focusing two sessions on this. And so, uh, for those who don't follow this very closely, uh, one-fourth of the U.S. federal government budget is devoted to health in the United States. It not only affects the lives of people across the country, we're one of the largest supporters of various global health activities. Uh, secondly, uh, for 10 years, which is the subject of the book, with both administrations, Bush and Obama, we have had heads of federal agencies come here and talk to our, our students, uh, CDC, FDA, uh, Medicare, and in the middle of these discussions, somebody will ask a question, why don't you move on this or that? And they all had the same one line, you don't understand the situation in the Congress. You don't understand the situation in the Congress. Uh, these two sessions are about uh, the situation of Congress. And what is the situation is that something has happened over 20 years where extreme polarization has led to gridlock on serious issues facing this country uh, uh, for this. Uh, and uh, we're doing this before the election, actually quite deliberately. The hope is that we would actually have a, a set of videos available to new people who come into Washington, president, leaders of the Congress, where they could watch and listen to two very distinguished leaders from the Senate talk about how to get out of this problem. And what attracted about the book and having two of them is a large number of political scientists have written, written brilliant pieces entitled The Problem. 
the dilemma is there's no end of the chapter about where we go uh, for this. And uh, so we are going to talk about the end of the book, which actually has very uh, uh, specific recommendations. So I am going to use most of my time to help him just walk through their real conclusions after thinking about this for, from years of experience. I have to be honest here, uh, I got a little nervous when I picked the book up. The first chapter is called The 228-Year Argument. And I was hoping we could resolve this in less than 228 years. Tretlot told me that we absolutely could do that. And so, but first help us, how did we get here? This is not a one-year phenomena. How do we go from a, a Congress that did function, lots of battles and arguments, but did function, to today's situation, Senator? Well, first of all, I'm glad Tom Daschle didn't tell you all of our experiences that we <laughs> had together. Uh, but also, uh, Bob, thank you for doing this. I want to thank the Harvard uh, Chan uh, School of uh, Public Health. Uh, for this opportunity to be here. And uh, Dr. Betty Johnson, thank you very much for, for your leadership. Uh, you know, America is an ongoing national argument, and I don't think that's bad. Uh, I've seen a lot of quotes the last few days that have struck me. One of them was, you know, uh, if you're not listening to somebody you don't agree with, you're probably not learning. Uh, and we will be a continuing argument. And in our book, Tom and I spend a part of it talking about how uh, we've had difficulties in our government from the very beginning. I mean, just think about Washington, Jefferson, Adams, Hamilton, Burr, you know that story. And the pre-Civil War, Civil War, turn of the century, Depression. We've always had very difficult times. But this is America, and we can solve these problems with a few good things. Communication, leadership, vision. What is the vision for America right now? Regardless of whether you're Democrat or Republican, what do you really want from America? I don't think our leaders are defining that for us right now, and that's one of the things we need to do. But uh, we have reached this point where we are for a variety of reasons. Uh, it was different when Tom Dash and I were the leaders. Now, it wasn't that long ago, the 90s, the turn of the century, we were the Democratic and Republican leaders back and forth. Uh, but we were different people in different times. The makeup of the Congress was different. Both parties have moved more to the extremes. The Republicans have become more conservative. Democrats have become much more uh, liberal. And maybe I shouldn't use the word much, but the, the center is almost non-existent right now, particularly in the Senate. Uh, when I was the, the Republican leader, I didn't have to worry about uh, or, or what I called the hell no caucus, uh, people just say no to everything. We found a way to get things done. Uh, and the way you do it is to reach out to them and, and listen to other people, but also have the courage to show leadership and say, we're going to get this done. Uh, you know, now I'm accused of having been a pragmatist, a deal maker. Well, yes. <laughs> I didn't come to Washington to make a statement. I went to Washington to try to make a difference for my poor state of Mississippi that needs a lot of help on a lot of, uh, in a lot of areas and for our country. But uh, so that's one of the things. The, the, the makeup of the Congress, personality-wise, has changed, has changed. Media is a big part of it. And I'm not damning the media, but it's so different now. When I first went to Washington as a staff member to a Democrat, and then when I was elected as a Republican to Congress, we didn't have fax machines. We didn't have cell phones. We answered the mail with a royal typewriter. <laughs> and we had hard lines. And people didn't just pick up the phone to call because it cost $5 if you made that call. They were very careful about how they made those calls. Now you've got 24-7 uh, news media. If you make a mistake, you're toast for two weeks or more. Uh, and everything you say is out there on Facebook or people are tweeting or twittering or whatever the <laughs> hell it is. Uh, but it, it's all out there. And I think that has had an effect on it. Uh, but more than anything else is our leaders have lost the ability to communicate to talk, to listen, and to act. But that can change pretty quickly. Just a few good men or women or both can change the dynamics in Washington, and it wouldn't take that long. But they're going to have to step up, and they're going to have to be willing to step up to tough issues like immigration reform, tax policy, infrastructure, uh, you name it, uh, defense issues. What are we going to do about defense spending? And uh, all of those issues take uh, real thought and wise people to provide leadership. So 
has there been some historic moments where it actually changed? The presidents changed how they interacted with Senate and House leaders. There were outside events that sort of made it much more difficult for people uh, to communicate. These things usually are not a flat line. They usually there are some one or two events, and it really starts to uh, change. From the well, uh, I think in the past, presidents were much more inclined to work directly with the Congress and with the leaders of both parties. Uh, you've heard the famous stories of Lyndon Johnson calling Everett Dirksen uh, on the civil rights legislation and saying, uh, Everett, I want to talk to you about this bill. And uh, Senator Dirksen from Illinois, the Republican leader, said, all right, I'll be right down the White House. He said, no, you stay there. I'm coming up to the Hill. Lyndon Johnson jumped in his limousine. He went up to Capitol Hill, to the Capitol, and met with Everett Dirksen. Uh, when I was a whip in the House, we met with President Reagan just about every Tuesday that the Congress was in session. And uh, sometimes it was just Republican leaders, but a lot of times it was both parties, and we sat down and we talked. I remember one time uh, I was sitting one person down from him, Bob Michael of Illinois, the Republican leader, and I was sitting next, and we were discussing monetary policy. And I'm watching, and the President is doodling. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh my Lord, he's not even listening. <laughs> Does he know what we're talking about here? So we're talking about the monetary policy, what the Fed was doing or not doing, should be doing. Finally, he tears the page off he'd been doodling on, turned it over, and he drew two lines. And he said, here's the problem. The monetary policy is supposed to stay in these lines. Now it's oversupply, inadequate supply. He drew, so he was listening. But the point is, we met with him regularly. Uh, the same thing with Bill Clinton. I've told the stories of a lot of people that, uh, you know, I talked to uh, President Clinton all the time. We had bipartisanship uh, meetings, uh, and he would call sometime when I didn't want to talk to him. <laughs> uh, but I remember the first time he called late at night, it was like 2 o'clock in the morning. And the phone was on uh, my wife Trisha's side of the bed. She answered the phone. She said, it's the president. I said, oh, okay. So she hands me the phone. <laughs> and I said, uh, yes, sir, Mr. President. I understand, yes, sir. Uh, well, we'll see what we could do, and talked on, and I handed the phone back to her, and she hung it up, and she said, what do you want? I said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Something about Central America, but we'll get to that later. <laughs> but, uh, and, and then the same thing uh, after 9-11, uh, Tom Daschle, uh, Dick Eppart, who was the Democratic leader, Denny Hassard, who was a speaker, we met with the president for bre breakfast. Every Tuesday we were in session at 7 a.m. to hear what it was going on with administration for him to hear what we were thinking about what was going on. But that has, it, it started dropping off uh, around 2004 and, and now the communication between the president and, and I, I told you those other stories to make sure you understand this is not a partisan stand. The, the president, uh, presidents and the Congress have stopped communicating the way they used to on a regular basis, hearing each other out, development plan. Tom Daschle proposes, my friend, the Democratic leader, that the next president take the congressional leadership, House and Senate, Republican and Democrat, up to Camp David and spend a weekend so that when he comes and does his first address of the joint session, he says, I have met with our leadership and these are the issues that we're going to take up together first. What a novel idea. But yet it's so simple when you really think about it. So that, that, uh, that is the number one issue now, is we've got to get the Democratic leader and the Republican leader in the Senate and the Speaker and the Democratic leader and the President, they've got to communicate more to talk about what the solutions are. One of the ways you do that, and one of the things I used to do when I was a majority leader is I, I wouldn't take up something I knew was going to be a war. I would try to find something that, where there might be a consensus. Take up the things that can be done. Infrastructure. Who in America does not think we need to do more about safe drinking water or about roads and, you know, sewer systems? So let's go there. Now the problem is how do you pay for it? That's always the big issue. But I've found that if you take a tough position and tell the people why, they will forgive you. Even if they don't. For instance, I have an education background. My mother was a school teacher. I worked for the University of Mississippi and all of that. Uh, but I voted for a separate Department of Education uh, back when I was in the House under the Reagan years. I was one of only five Republicans that voted for a separate Department of Education. My constituents did not agree with me. 
but I wrote a column in my quarterly newsletter saying, this is why I voted for this. I thought that education was being squeezed out by the current Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. And he health and welfare was squeezing out education, and I felt like education deserved its own department. My constituents never agreed with me, but they accepted the argument. And that's the kind of thing that you need more of in Washington today to begin to change the dynamics. And a f just a few people can make that change pretty quickly. Uh, how about the general dynamics in the House and Senate? You were talking before yeah. about things that have changed. What sort of? Well, the House has, has gotten much more difficult to manage. Uh, you know, the Speaker of the House is supposed to have ultimate power in that he controls the Rules Committee and the Rules Committee to controls the flow to the floor. When you've got 435 people, it's like an anthill. You can't just have everybody offering every member they want to. You've got to have some controls. They have that. But the Speaker now has more difficulty pulling together even his own caucus. Um, and that is different. When I was there counting votes during the Reagan years as a whip, working with Bob Michael of Illinois, the leader, working with Tip O'Neill, the Speaker, um, you, you didn't have that. And i tell you one thing I think we miss in Congress today, and I, I felt this in the Senate. Uh, we had a great senator from Alaska named Ted Stevens. Now, Ted Stevens was a classic World War II veteran. He flew, flew planes over the Himalayas in World War II. But one day we had a great argument over budgets, and my leadership team and, and the con conference of Republicans had basically decided we were going to limit spending to this level. He didn't agree. He called me on the phone, and typically of him, he was very loud and threatening. And I responded in kind, being from Mississippi, you know, we, we like a good fight. Uh, so uh, we basically hung up on each other. Five minutes later, he comes charging into my office, went right by my receptionist, right by the keeper of the body, right into my office, and I stood up because I thought I was going to have to fight this little guy. <laughs> he was smaller than me. He stormed right up to the desk and said, I don't agree with the budget number. I don't think it's sufficient for us to do what we need to do, but the leadership has made the decision. I'll make it work. And he wheeled out and left. He understood that you have to have leaders and you have to have followers and men and women have to come to terms with making that work. Those World War II veterans are not there now. Uh, and there's an element that they brought that I think we, we really miss. So one other point you had made earlier, for all of us, planes were a great addition to our life. But it turns out, in your view, uh, planes had an impact on the Congress. I give a lot of credit for that to Tom Daschle. Uh, he says that the, the biggest problem in Washington is the airplane. And there's a lot of truth to that because it's so easy now to hop on a plane and, and fly to, uh, to Georgia or to Massachusetts and spend the weekend with your family. And what has happened is uh, members of Congress stopped bringing their families to Washington. And so they fly in on a Monday, uh, a Monday afternoon or Tuesday morning and all they want to know is what time I'm going to leave Thursday. First of all, it's a dog's life. And one of many things that Tom and I recommend in this book is that members should not sleep in their offices. It's demeaning. It's undignified. It's the worst form of public housing, in my opinion. <laughs> Forty-seven members of Congress, I believe, sleep in their offices, and they don't bring their families home. Now, why does that matter? First of all, you're exhausted. You're flying back and forth. Uh, and secondly, you don't get to know the people you're working with. Uh, and one of the key components of, of leadership and getting things done is chemistry. And chemistry is just knowing each other, socializing with each other, maybe, you know, uh, wearing a kilt and laughing at each other, or wearing a seersucker suit on a seersucker Thursday. And, uh, you know, I started that tradition when I was in the Senate that one year we, a bunch of us wore seersucker suits, but none of the women. So at the end of that uh, day, uh, Diane Feinstein from California came up to me and said, now, Senator Lott, is, is this a man thing? And I said, no, Diane, women actually wear a seersucker more than men. Men are chicken to wear it a lot of times. And she said, well, can we join in? I said, please do. She found that a lot of the women didn't have the outfit. She had each one of the women in the Senate an outfit of seersucker made. The next year, we had 32 members of, of the Senate wear seersucker suit. Here's why that's important. Diane Feinstein, a Democrat from California, helped make that happen. And she was generous in how it happened. We laughed at each other. We wore white bucks. Uh, Bob Bennett from Utah even wore a, a hat. He looked ridiculous. 
Uh, but that is all, uh, you know, a derivation from the plane itself. Those things don't happen. And it makes a huge difference when you know somebody. Uh, you know, I never could be mean to Ted Kennedy because I knew his wife, Vicki. She was a Louisiana girl, so I knew she was good. Uh, but, uh, and, and my neighbors across the street in Virginia where I brought my family, and my, my, my son here, Chet, went to Thomas Jefferson High School, our daughter went to Annandale High School, they, right across the street were three Democrats on the other side of the street. Well, we lived on opposite sides of the street with the Republicans. <laughs> our kids played together. My wife was the godmother of, of John Bro's, uh, one of his daughters, a Democrat. Those things don't happen. And those things are the lubricant mm -hmm. that makes the place work. That's why the title of the book, Crisis Point, is not just Crisis Point, it's why we must and how we can overcome our broken politics in Washington and across America. If I had to have a theme for today, it would not be Crisis Point, but it's that you should never waste a crisis. America's got a certain degree of crisis right now politically and economically we need to find a way to get things done. And we are known in America for getting things done anytime we're faced with a crisis, whether it's a hurricane or a war. We shouldn't waste this crisis point. Uh, Senator, uh, I have to ask one question from my own area. So I, I follow polls very closely. And one of the things you see is on a whole range of domestic issues, people who say they're Republican and Democrat become further apart every single year. Is that a leadership problem? Is that something that's going on culturally in the country? But it must be tougher to reach any agreement if the constituents back home uh, are, are, are not doing things together. They just go further, whether it's schools or it's health care or it's what we do with the social security system. People are creeping uh, apart. Uh, is there something leaders do? Would it be better if we could narrow some of those differences a bit? Yeah, I think the answer is all of the above. Yeah. It, it, uh, it really begins with the people. The people uh, are the ones that elect the Congress. Unfortunately, uh, we've lost a lot of our civic responsibility feelings in America. People don't vote. Uh, and quite often the people who do vote are the people that are mad about something. And that is contributing to what we have in Washington, but also it, it requires leadership. If the men and women in leadership in Washington would try to find a way to work. For instance, I read in the, the news this very morning where Mitch McConnell says one of the things, and, and he's the uh, majority leader in the Senate, that one of the things they're going to do in the lame duck session after the election before the end of the year is more funds for medical research. How about that? The majority leader has advocated medical research. Now. Uh, the Democrats, Harry Reid, they ought to jump all over that. This is an area you all care about. There's a, there's a window of opportunity there. And you might say, okay, we're going to do more funding for medical research, and by the way, could we do a little more over here, perhaps? You, you see how far you can e expand it. I used to do that with Tom Daschle all the time. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a conservative Republican. He was a prairie liberal Democrat. We were here. But there was enough space in there between us. I would try to pull him over a little bit more, just a little right of center, and he'd be trying to pull me back and forth. But I found that, and this is a trite thing to say this, but it's true. Give a little, you get a little, or maybe a lot. And one of the things I used to do with Tom, and he would tell you this, is when I had the majority, I had the votes. I could win. I could beat him. But I would sometimes go over and sit down next to Tom on his side of the political d divide, the aisle in the Senate, and say, Tom, I think we got the votes. But is there something maybe we could do for you or for your team that would maybe help this go down a little easier? And quite often he would say something really pretty simple, not that expensive, and I'd try to do it. And that's, that's how it uh, can be made to work. But it, it's all across America. That's one of the reasons in this book, Tom and I talk about the need to, to address the civic uh, needs and civic responsibilities. How do we get people to vote? Uh, simple things like, I think they ought to vote. Why do we vote on Tuesday? Do you know the history? There's no good reason, except that that's when people used to go to market on Tuesday. We vote on Tuesday. Louisiana is the only state in the country that's figured it out. Vote on Saturday. 
My dad didn't vote sometime because he worked at the shipyard. He was exhausted. He was dirty. Crawled around in the holes of the ships as a pipe fitter. He wouldn't vote. A little bitty thing. And the primary system. Does anybody really think that our primary system of selecting our nominee is working real good in America? <laughs> Did you look at the election this year? What happened? Uh, it, it was the weirdest thing I've ever seen. So we advocate a single primary day. So can you go for, further with that? Because this is actually a, anybody who suffered through 20 months of this has to believe that there's a better way. Yeah. So what is your view about and with this maybe sort of the closing point, right. uh, given the f first session, what is your view about how we could make that work better? Uh, you mean the primary system? Primary system. Well, no, I don't, I don't want to make my friends in New Hampshire and Iowa mad, but uh, I would like to have this single primary day or at maybe uh, five regional uh, primaries, the Northeast primary, the Southern primary, the Western primary, but then every four years alternate it so not one region gets the first attention all the time. But it's more focused, it would cost less. I think one of the reasons why campaigns have gotten so coarse, and that's the nicest word I can say for it, is where we've de degraded ourselves now, is because it's endless. <laughs> and also there is, a, there is the money problem. I mean, it, it, I'm amazed at what is spent in these states. Now, little states have $40 million spent in a Senate race. You could buy the whole state for that. So we need to address uh, some of the, the, these issues. How do we get people to participate more? How can we have a better primary system? And by the way, that won't be easy. Sometimes it might take a constitutional amendment. Or also, you know, election laws are really done state by state. How do you get 50 states? But you know how? You begin with one. You just get started. It's time in America that we take a look at uh, why people are disillusioned, why they're mad, why they don't vote. Uh, I'm, you know, some people say, well, Republicans are trying to suppress the vote. I don't believe that. Uh, I don't want that. I want everybody to vote. Now, I am an American. I'm not going to require that everybody vote like they do in Australia. But we need to give people more of a reason to believe and to participate because this great republic is in danger, but it is worth saving, and we can do it. Uh, we're going to have that as the last piece that will appear on our screen next time. Senator, thank you very much. We're about to split into a more informal uh, student set of questions. Uh, but for those watching across the world, there is something that can be done about this issue. We are very pleased that both senators came here to lay out an agenda uh, so the future might be different in, in the world of health politics than it has been. Senator, again, thank you very much.